So yeah, over the next couple of slides, I first want to give you an introduction about HIV. So currently, around 40, uh, 38 million people are living with HIV. And HIV, although we've made several advances over the last few decades, is still not curable, but it is treatable. And due to this treatment, we're able to control the HIV infection. However, even if you're taking treatment, and if you've been doing that for decades or for very long times, the moment you stop your therapy, the virus will come back in a matter of weeks. And the question is how is this uh, viral rebound happening? And this is due to ex the existence of a very low number of infected cells that are able to persist, called the HIV-1 latent reservoir. So this persistent reservoir is a really scarce number of cells. We're talking about around 1 in 100, 1 in 10,000 infected CD4 T cells. To make it even more complex, not all of these infected cells are actually relevant. Each infected cell will actually carry a different HIV-1 variant, and most of them will be defective. So, in order to get to a treatment, we really need to understand how this reservoir is uh, able to persist, so we need to look into depth about, for this method. So then the question is, how can we study this? I will just be quickly going over the current way of doing things, so if we want to sequence those HIV inserts. We use a nested PCR of around 9 KB, which is approximately the length of HIV, and we target with the primers around 92%. And currently, we do it based on the principle, principles of limiting dilution, where you will take um, your DNA, you will dilute it. So if you take a 96 well plate, around 30% or less of your reactions should be positive. And this is to ensure that you have one single copy in a well if you have a positive band on your gel. So you will do your nested PCR, you will visualize on the gel, and then you will select your amplicons for sequencing most of the time through Illumina. So it's a very laborious, very hard, uh, and very uh, expensive way of doing things. But of course, this has shown us some interesting things. We actually do know now that around 2 to 5% of those HIV-infected cells are carrying a genome intact sequence. So it's not really a lot. So it's very costly, it's very labor intensive. So that's why we turn to long read sequencing to find a way to overcome this laboriousness, to overcome this, these principles of limiting dilution. And that's how we came up with our new assay. So this was based actually on a method that was published in uh, 2021 in Nature Methods. And there they used this dual UMI strategy to target amplicants. And we've played around a bit and actually adapted it to HIV because it's a bit more challenging. We're dealing really with a low number of templates that we actually want to enrich from this background of non-infected cells. So what we do right now is do, uh, do a pre-amplification step of a few cycles. And then we will come in with a tagging step where we will target HIV and add those dual UMIs. And those UMIs will ensure, first of all, they will allow us to ensure the different viruses and to distinguish them from one and the other. They will also allow us to increase the accuracy and um, resolve any chimeric or PCR uh, products that have been formed during uh, amplification processes. But as I said, we're dealing with a really low amount of target uh, DNA, so we had, to, we had to play around with a number of cycles of preamplification to get around in the 1000 uh, condition, the patient level condition, to get around, uh, up to six cycles of preamplification to ensure detection of our HIV. So this was done as a cell line, and it seemed to work quite okay. And then we do just a regular amplification of four times 10 cycles to enrich for our UMI tech material. Why four times 10? Well, as I said before, HIV is really diverse, and we have a lot of deleted, shorter vi viruses. And if you would do a regular 40 cycles PCR, you will only enrich for your short HIV amplicons, and you also, that's not what you really want. So based on this, this is what you see. This is DNA. These are six replicates from the same patient. And actually, what you can see now is this nice smear, those no nice ladder-like patterns that are actually different HIV amplicons. Then we'll take those amplicons, we'll put them on a flow sample or nanopore, and we will just get our long read data. And then we have this uh, real uh, uh, computational uh, pipeline that allows us to detect the UMIs, bin the reads all together, and then get up to polishing uh, our reads. So for instance, now I'm showing data which was done, which was done with the old R10 flow cell, the R10.3. And actually, as you can see, with the increasing, increasing coverage of your uh, reads in each bin, you can get up to Q30 coverage with only 15 uh, reads. 
And actually, what only remains with us at that uh, coverage are mismatches. So we resolve insertions and deletions and that kind of stuff. And it's really needed if you wanted to start looking at is the genome intact or not, because one SNP can make a big difference. And then, uh, because we do this pre-amplification step, we will have more HIV templates. So basically, what we can do then is cluster different uh, UMIs and combine them together in a megabin consensus. That's how we call it. So okay, let's get into some quick benchmarking. So this is the, the normal way of doing it. We took DNA, we took a 96 well plate that around, gave us around 30-ish positive si uh, samples, and we sequenced them. And as you can see right here in white, we have a unique sequence, and in gray, you have sequences that we've served m multiple times, because HIV can also sometimes be clonal to make it even more complex. Uh, but this is a, a huge cost, $50 per provirus. And this is by doing it with our new technology, where we do six PCR replicates. And as you can see, you get a lot more of uh, HIV viruses with only six PCRs. Interestingly, we can also look for overlaps because HIV is clonal. So if we compare those assays, we can actually do some actual benchmarking. So when we compare the uh, nanopore proviruses with the Illumina uh, proviruses, you can see that we get up to, due to the mega binning, up to 99.990% uh, accuracy, which is really nice. And, uh, and also, we don't observe any biases in the size of the proviruses that we detect, because that's also something that we want to resolve. We don't want to get only short stuff, so there's no significant difference. And in addition, we ob do observe a slightly lower efficiency, but still, it's not really significantly different. So we're still detecting from our input template around 11% uh, of our HIV viruses. So, okay, it was working quite well. It held up against the currently used methods. So that's when we went, wanted to go big. So we have a cohort of DNA samples from people living with HIV, and we just run our assay on 18 of them. And then you can get this of, uh, these kind of plots. So we have uh, sequenced all the viruses, and then we did the classification. We looked, are they intact, are they deleted, that kind of stuff. And it's really nice to get this uh, kind of uh, resolution of for each individual. Interestingly, we got around 1,600 total HIV proviruses with this technique across all the individuals, uh, with a mean yield of around 15 viruses per PCR replicate. So that's way more if you would, uh, than uh, regular methods. And interestingly, also, the proportion of intact sequences is the same as we've seen in the past. So there's real, real bias. So, okay. What else can we do? So we can get these plots. We can ac identify intact sequences, which might be the relevant fraction. It actually causes for the persistence. We can do all kind of stuff. We can uh, do, for instance, phylogenetics, when we take all the intact sequences, the 9KB sequences, and do a big tree, uh, as you can see here. So we had 14 participants with at least one intact provirus. And um, actually, nine out of those 14 do have uh, intact clones. So those are clonally expanding cells that are carrying in carrying an integrated HIV-1 copy that they are persisting and that are probably the cause of why HIV is so hard to get rid of. It just lingers on and it remains uh, in your body. So to summarize and to have some final conclusions, we have a scalable and high throughput assay with a tenfold decrease in cost per each genome. So it's really nice to have this kind of tool in hand because this allows us to do way more samples uh, with the same kind of budget as you would regularly have. It also overcomes a lower single read accuracy that is mostly associated with those older nanopore technologies, so the R9 and the R10. Uh, you can get rid of all those uh, mistakes. And yeah, the research that we have done really validates, uh, is validated on this large cohort of samples with a lot of different uh, parameters. So it's right, really nice to see that it's still working on, on different patient samples because that also can be tricky with HIV. And yeah, it really has a f future diagnostic potential to really provide scalable, high throughput data and qualitative insights in the HIV-1 provider reservoir that you can use when you, re when you want to test, for instance, new curative in uh, uh, interventions. So with that, I want to acknowledge all the participants who donated samples to our study and, of course, all the members of my lab who contributed to uh, this essay. Thank you.